Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you uh, gathered back together again. Uh, thank you for that reading. I, I really appreciate our young people. Um, we've been kind of bouncing around um, Bible classes on Sunday morning. We started in the youth class this morning because we're, we're very youthful, and, and that's really where we belong. But we'll we'll keep bouncing just you know just to get to see everybody. It was crazy to me, Jonathan announced in youth class this morning that they're retiring the buses. And I thought, man, my youth group rode around in those buses. And we're sitting there in youth class looking around at those names around the wall yet again. And I'm thinking, some of you are getting old. <laughs> Not me, but well, anyway, it's good to be with you again. Oh, and I wanted to mention, uh, I mentioned something about a sticker on my hand a couple of weeks back. And some of y'all were saying, I was wondering what that was. And y'all got hawk eyes. I didn't know y'all would even see that until I said something about it. So if you're wondering if it's uh, bothering you, that's Elsa right there. Uh, it has no theological importance, but thank you, Ariana, uh, for my tie pen. That's what that is, if you're wondering. Uh, I saw a, a video clip this week. I would not recommend it. It's just uh, one of those things that came across uh, Facebook and had an interesting title. And so I watched it. It's, uh, I wouldn't recommend it because the man that is featured in this video is someone who is just one of the worst individuals I, I know on media right now. Real time with Bill Maher. Uh, if you know who Bill Maher is, if you're familiar with him, uh, if you're not, he, he's just one of the most anti-God heathens in, in our country right now. Uh, really just spits out a lot of venom uh, against religion. He won't tell you he's an atheist. He uses the term apatheist. He says, I don't know where we go when we die, and I don't really care. Uh, and he will care one day, but uh, for now, I really hope he turns it around. But, but in this video, and this was back from June 5th of this year on his show, uh, he picked a couple of different conservative personalities and he quoted some things that they had said. I want to read you these quotes and then we'll talk a little bit about where he's going with all this. Governor Mike Huckabee uh, was quoted as saying, We are moving rapidly towards the criminalization of Christianity. You might have felt that before. You, you might have seen what uh, Governor Huckabee is uh, saying there, what he's getting at there. He said, moving rapidly towards the criminalization. Senator Ted Cruz, uh, who is uh, running for uh, the, the nominee right now, Senator Ted Cruz, he said, there is a liberal fascism that is going after Christian believers. Bill O'Reilly said, if you're a Christian or a white man in the USA, it's open season on you. And Senator Rick Santorum, he cautioned that America should keep in mind Nazi Germany, where you go from Christians, Jews obviously, but also Christians, not just being persecuted, but being put to death. And of course, Marr on his show, he's quoting all these, not because he agrees with them, but he's quoting them to mock them, uh, because he also brings up a 2014 Pew Research poll that says 71% of Americans still claim some form, some affiliation with Christianity. And he asked that, the question he asked is, who is going to be criminal, criminalizing, putting to death, persecuting Christians if 71% of us are Christians? And I don't like him. I'll just throw that out there. I, I don't like him. I think he mocks the God that created him, and one day he will uh, he will answer for that. But this is a big question right now. This is a question that our country is wrestling with because we see some things on, on one hand. It's, it's very concerning uh, to see when groups like InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship is kicked off of college campuses. Uh, it's very concerning when we see Christians dragged into court because they operate their businesses on the basis of their beliefs. Uh, it's very concerning that since 1973 and 42, 43 years, we have legalized the murder of 60 million infants in the womb. These things are very concerning. And so I see where Huckabee, where Santorum, where these folks are coming from. But on the other hand, I see something in Mars comments that we also have to deal with. That if we are to be honest in the way that we deal with these discussions, we have to think about this. We live in the freest least persecuted generation this world has ever known as far as God followers goes, Christ followers goes. I can worship whenever I want to. I can worship however I want to. I, I can go knock on every single door in this country and tell people about Jesus Christ. They can tell me to leave. That's their freedom. But my freedom is I can go and I can say what I want to in the name of Christ. 
I, well, I can preach it here. I can preach it from the pulpit. I can go down to the street corner. I can preach it there. I can get on the radio waves and I can preach it there. I can preach it on the television station. I can get on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, and all these places in this country. I'm completely and totally free to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and you know, I think of complaining to the Apostle Paul about some of the downfalls of our country right now. How do you think that conversation would go? Paul, Paul, do you know that we cannot pray in, and it's not just all the public schools, most of our public schools. There are still public schools today that do have uh, prayer, and, and thank God for that. Do you know, Apostle Paul, that I cannot pray in all the public schools in this land? Do you know last year they passed a law, Apostle Paul, that says that uh, homosexuals can get married and, and, and enjoy that uh, legal union that used to be just for man and woman. Do you know, Apostle Paul, that since 1973 that our country has allowed for the murder of 60 million infants? Do you know this? And I, and I, think, I think the Apostle Paul kind of looks at you and he says, Really? Do you have any idea how often I was in prison for the gospel? Do you have any idea what my government allowed for? Do you have any idea what I went through? I mean, think through your Bible with me for just a second about the history of man, the history of persecution of God's people. The Bible starts okay. I mean, there's, there's no persecution for the first couple of chapters there. Adam and Eve, they have problems, but they cause those problems. They're not really persecuted. Uh, but Genesis chapter 4, you have Abel who was killed for offering a more excellent sacrifice. And right there, the first God follower who was persecuted for his faith or his expression of faith. From Genesis 5 through Genesis 10, you have the, the world get into this downward spiral where eventually every single person is wicked except for this one family, Noah and his family, and they are saved. And that's the way that the, the world looked in his day. You get to Genesis chapter 11 and you have the Tower of Babel where they get in their minds that they're going to be as big as God is. And he lets them know that they are not as big as he is. And then you get to Genesis chapter 12, and, and from there on out you have the story of three, four men, basically. Abraham, called to walk out not knowing where he is going, and he wanders the rest of his life. Isaac, same deal, wanders for his entire life. Jacob, on the run, basically, for his entire life. And then Joseph, who, because of persecution, is sent down into Egypt, where the entire nation goes into persecution and in slavery. Uh, you have Exodus through Deuteronomy. Basically, you go from slavery to wandering in the wilderness, some wars. You finally end right at the gate of the promised land. And Joshua is kind of a good book. Uh, Joshua, it's not an easy book. They're in war the whole time, but they are conquering the promised land. They are doing what God said to do. But then you go to Judges. And it's up and it's down. They, they, they obey God, but then they turn from him, and then he punishes them, and he oppresses them, and they turn back to him, and it's just a cycle over and over. Very frustrating, the book of Judges is, to me. First Samuel through Second Chronicles, that history there, we have the raising of the king. There in Saul, God uh, picks that king because the nation wants one so badly. And Saul's in and out of wars with the Philistines, but then David finally brings a good period to the nation, a period of peace and David is a good king. Solomon starts as a good king, uh, but then he falls away. And his heart is pulled away from his God by uh, his foreign wives. Uh, the kingdom gets split. There, there's never really a solid kingdom from there on out, and eventually captivity comes to both the north and the south. And then you have Ezra, Daniel, Esther, those books there where it really the, the, the nation's in a bad situation. They're trying to rebuild, and yet uh, they're always under the thumb of foreigners. Pull forward into the New Testament, and we got Roman oppression, persecution, Jewish persecution of Christians. And then from there on out, that's what we see until now. As we walk through our own Bible, as we walk through the history of the followers of God, we see persecution after persecution after persecution. And Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 through 39, Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake we'll find it. And it's just concerning to me that all through the history of God's people, there has been suffering, there has been persecution, and now we come to today and we are very, very free. Very little persecution that we see in this country. And it just makes me wonder a couple of things. Number one, how long is this going to last? It's concerning for that reason because I don't know how long this period of freedom is going to last. Number two, am I fully taking advantage of it? 
Uh, I have all these freedoms that millions of followers of God throughout history would have longed for, would have died to have the kind of freedoms I have today. Am I taking full advantage of those freedoms and doing what I can that others could not? And and number three, and most uneasy of all of these, I, I wonder, am I enjoying this peace only because I've not fully done this, because I've not fully taken up my cross? Would I be seeing more persecution if I were following Jesus' command here more strictly and taking up my cross and following him. Today, our study is going to center around one man who did this, who took up his cross and he suffered the reproach of Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, Moses chose affliction with God's people because he understood the reproach of Christ to be greater than the treasures of Egypt. I find it very interesting. Moses would not have understood this term. Uh, He would not have understood reproach of Christ. Uh, He did not yet know the Christ. He knew there was a prophet coming like him, Uh, But he did not know this term, reproach of Christ. But that's exactly what he did. He took up the reproach of Christ. And if you wanted to go and read what he did, you could go to Exodus chapter 2. I want to go to Acts chapter 7. Stephen gives us a very good historical account of Exodus chapter 2. And I think Stephen is better suited for our purposes because he's preaching what we're trying to preach right now. How did Moses live out the reproach of Christ? If you want to turn to Acts chapter 7 with me, I want to read uh, this passage, verses 22 through 29, and talk about the reproach of Christ in the life of Moses. Beginning there in verse 22. Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Kind of a side note there, when Moses kept saying, I can't speak, I can't speak, uh, Stephen comes back and he says, no, he was mighty in words. That was an excuse. He was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, this account of the life of Moses. It's fascinating in its own right. What we're reading here is the speech of a Greek man. You remember how the Jews had had come up against Stephen because of what Stephen stood for and what Stephen was uh, preaching, and they brought him before the council. And this Greek man delivers such a stunning sermon based on the history of the Israelites. And it makes them so mad because he, a Greek, is teaching them their own history, and he's reminding them of some things. And so as he does so, they stop up their ears, and they rush at him, and they drag him out of the city, and they stone him, and they kill him. His name, Stephen, Stephanos, means victory crown. And that day he received his victory crown as he preached the gospel. But listen to what he does here in this account of history. He, he doesn't alter history. He presents the history of Moses, but he does so in the way that we learn about Christ. He he does so in a way that he explains the part of Moses' history that prefigured what Jesus would do. Think again about verse 25. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Does that sound like Jesus? Verse 27 The man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over over us? Now, Stephen drives these two verses home a second time. Look at verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. You see where Stephen is headed where all this? We, We... touched on this actually this morning. Uh, Stephen is saying, you're accusing me of blaspheming Moses, but look at your own history. In your own history, it's you who rejected Moses. And look what Moses said here in verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. 
Jesus Christ came supposing that you would understand that God was offering you salvation at his hand, redemption at his hand, and you did not understand. You recall this morning we read Luke 12 and verse 14, man who made me a judge and an arbitrator over you. Not that he wasn't. He was, but he wanted the man to realize God made me a judge over you. God made me an arbitrator over you. And now Jesus is this prophet like Moses. And just as the Israelites did not understand their deliverance from Egypt, just as they pushed back and said, who made you a ruler and a judge? Now they're rejecting Christ the exact same way. They don't understand his deliverance. They don't understand that he is ruler and judge. So, so what is the reproach of Christ? Christ gave up incredible riches. He came to this earth to deliver, to judge, to rule a people that would despise and reject him, even as he hung on that cross for him. And by faith, Moses looks to this reproach of Christ as being greater than all the treasure of Egypt. He didn't know the term reproach of Christ, but here's three things that he did know. And these are the three things that I want us to talk about in our time remaining. Here's what it boils down to. Number one, he gave up ease and pleasure. He knew that. He was giving up ease and pleasure. Number two, he was serving a people that did not even appreciate his service. And number three, he understood the eternal reward. That's the reproach of Christ that we see both in the ministry of Christ and in the ministry of Moses. Let's take a look at each one of these three. Number one, he gave up ease and pleasure. He chose not to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now, let's think about what that means exactly, because you might hear fleeting pleasures and you might be tempted to think uh, just a couple of minutes, just a couple of hours, just a couple of days, a fleeting pleasure, something that doesn't last that very long. But in Moses' terms, in Moses' day, what fleeting pleasure meant was an entire lifetime. He gave up an entire lifetime of nobility, an entire lifetime of having whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He was going to be a prince over the most great, the, the most powerful nation in the entire world. That's what fleeting pleasure meant to Moses. And remember when we started this whole series, we said a hero of faith is someone who sees life as God sees it, and they see God in their life. This is seeing life as God sees it. God sees an entire lifetime as fleeting. God sees an entire lifetime as a vapor. And Moses saw it the same way. Even if I'm to be prince of Egypt for my entire life, that's a fleeting pleasure. It's short. It's not what others would think. We might hear fleeting pleasures of sin, and we might think something that is morally wrong, a sinful action. But back to the text, we don't read that Moses did anything that was morally questionable. We, we don't read that he was oppressing the Hebrews. We don't read that he was even devoting himself to those foreign gods of the Egyptians. He wasn't doing anything morally wrong. What we're talking about here when we talk about fleeting pleasures of sin, we're talking about the sin of inaction. James chapter 4 and verse 17, so whoever knows to do the right thing, uh, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it to him, it is sin. Moses didn't have to break God's law in order to get tangled up in the fleeting pleasures of sin. All he had to do was sit there and do nothing. And, and that's his, his uh, dilemma, his choice that he had to make. Either I sit back and I do nothing, that's enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin, or I get to work for God and allow him to use me for the purpose for which he raised me. And that's the same application that we have today. Yeah, I've, I've heard some sermons refer to the, the fleeting pleasures of sin as, as something that is wrong and you know you shouldn't do it and it only lasts just a little bit, but you, you do it anyway and there's this lifetime of regret. And, and you, could, you could say that, you could use that application. But in the context, what, what it's really talking about here with Moses, it's, it's a lifetime of not playing nice with the world. Uh, Moses made that decision, no, I'm, I'm not going to spend my life taking it easy when God put me here for something greater. I'm not going to soak in that physical prosperity that, that God placed here in Egypt that I could take uh, advantage of at the expense of spiritual inaction. I'm going to get to work for my God. And so, number one, he gave up ease and he gave up pleasure, and he got to work for his God. Uh, number two, he served a people that didn't even appreciate his service. In Exodus chapter two, he, he tries to help his brethren, but he's met with rejection. They say, who made you a prince? Who made you a judge? And so he leaves. And 40 years, he's off in the land of Midian. And then remember, he comes back. And they accept him then. They're, they're pretty happy to see Moses coming after 40 years until Pharaoh starts to punish them. And then they start grumbling. And they grumble. And they grumble in Egypt. 
And then they grumble as they're coming out of Egypt. They grumble at the Red Sea. They grumble when they're thirsty. They grumble when they're hungry. They grumble. Moses, he's this guy. We don't know where he went. He's been gone too long. Let's make ourselves a god. And they make a golden calf. And they grumble. And they grumble. And they grumble. By faith, Moses esteems the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. That means serving people that don't appreciate your service. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. When you do unto others as you would have them do unto you, when, when, when you repay evil with good, when you give your time and your heart on money for the, for the benefit of others and they turn around and they grumble, well, where am I looking for my reward? Was I looking to them for my reward? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus warns about doing several things. He, he says, don't fast to be seen of others. Don't pray to be seen of others. Don't give charitably to be seen of others. Because he says, in each, in each case, truly I say to you, they have received their reward, those who do such things. But he says, for those who seek the approval of God, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Yeah, it feels good to be appreciated by others. It, it feels good when others acknowledge what we have done for their good and for the for the good of the kingdom it feels good you know if you go to one of those dinners where you've given money and they've got your name on that little placard saying this person is important to us because they supported this cause those things they feel good but the approval of man makes for a terrible motivation for the service of the christian because often men disapprove of what is good often men don't understand god's definition of what is good and what is right and what is holy and so taking on the reproach of, of Christ, it means that Christians do good for others even because God appreciates it when others might themselves hate us for it. And we, treat, we teach the truth of the gospel because we believe it's God's gift for eternal life. Even though some might hate it, some might resent us for that message, we preach it anyways. Number three, Moses understood the eternal reward. He gave up ease and pleasure. He, he preached and he served even to those who did not appreciate his service because, number three, he understood the eternal reward. I want to ask you to consider what does heaven mean to you? Uh, we see here in the life of Moses, what did heaven mean to Moses? Well, it's kind of like an accounting system that we're, we're given here. We're, we're shown a picture of scales. On one side, you have the treasures of Egypt. In our terms, in today's terms, that's never wanting anything ever again. Uh, you want a new car? Go take your pick. Corvette, BMW, Mercedes, whatever you want, go get your new car. You want a new home? Go find the, the biggest home on the river, on the lake, on the wherever you want it. That's what you get. Uh, you, you want uh, food? You want, you want money? Whatever you want. The treasure of Egypt, that's on one side of the scales. On the other side, we have words like reproach, words like mistreatment. It's actually the opposite of the treasures of Egypt. You forget picking out your car. You have no car. You walk wherever you go, and you don't get to go where you would like to go. You walk across the desert here in, in the Arabian sun. No such thing as a vacation. No such thing as a home. And you're walking around with a group of grumbling people and and I imagine a very, very smelly and, and not a very good life. Not what you would pick. We have the reproach of Christ. We have mistreatment with the people of Israel. Moses puts the treasures of Egypt on one side, and he puts the reproach of Christ on the other side, and he takes one glance, and he says, oh, it's no contest. You say, you're right, it's no contest. He said, the reproach is way better. You say, excuse me? The reproach better? Of course the reproach is better. Why is that, Moses? Well, do you not see the eternal reward up there with it? Do you not see heaven up there with it? This morning, uh, this, this afternoon, are you living your life with heaven in view? Because heaven made all the difference. Heaven turns the tables. Well, with heaven in the mix, uh, you, you can put your dream life on one side, and you can put the worst life on the other side, and it doesn't matter. Because heaven's the only thing that matters. In the scope of heaven, everything is this brief, fleeting, passing shadow. By faith, do you live in view of heaven and this afternoon, I want to encourage you with the life of Moses, a man who gave up the ease and the pleasure there in Egypt for the reproach of Christ, a man who served the unservable, loved the unlovable because of the reproach of Christ, because he understood 
the reward of heaven. This afternoon, let's, let's all make it our charge to live with heaven in view. This afternoon, if you're not a Christian, if you're not living uh, for the reproach of Christ, if, if you're not following him, can I ask you to take a look at your life and ask the question, what, what ease can I give up for him? What pleasure can I give up for him? What service can I yield to him, even to those who are unservable? If you're not a Christian this afternoon, I kind of encourage you to come to this God because with heaven in the mix, it really is the only thing that matters. And your Lord lives to make intercession for you. If you're not a Christian, please come to him this afternoon. And if you are a Christian and yet you've not been following him, if you've not been rendering him your service, I want to ask you to rededicate yourself to him. If there's anything in your life that's keeping you from him, any sin that's holding you back, please let go of that. Please repent of that. If you just need encouragement, if you need strength, from your church family. If you have any need, please come while we stand and while we